Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, economic freedom and human progress. Uh, let's start with it. This is a very important graph. It shows uh, the progress of humanity since the year zero. And the late economist, Angus Madison, uh, went on to calculate what was the per capita income of humanity since the year zero to the year 2000. And this is what he found. He found that during basically 18 centuries, the per capita income of humanity, the level of wealth created by men, was basically stagnant. It was the equivalent of less than $1 per day. Less than $1 per day since uh, the 1800s. So uh, something happened in the 1800s, at least in the late 1700s, 1800s, where mankind started producing wealth. It started creating wealth. And people began growing richer. Nations began getting wealthier. So back then, as you can see, we also started experiencing a significant decline in poverty. In 1820, 85% of the world population lived with less than $1 per day. And since then, since then it has been decreasing dramatically and now, for the first time in history, there is serious discussion that we might live in a world without extreme poverty within 30 years. So we have experienced tremendous progress in the last 200 years. What is behind this creation of wealth? What is behind this dramatic decline in poverty levels in the last 200 years? One of the first observers of this phenomenon was an ethics professor in Scotland named Alan Smith. Alan Smith, uh, he wasn't an economist because back then there was no economics. Uh, he was an ethics professor. He wrote a book in 1759 about uh, the theory of moral sentiments. That was uh, about philosophy. That was uh, the topic of his first book. And uh, within this book, he mentioned something about what was until then a very new phenomenon which was nations being wealthier. Let's remember, the, the level of income of humanity was basically stagnant for 17 centuries. And he wrote the following. He said, little less is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural course of things. Adam Smith was back then identifying the factors that, according to him, were behind this dramatic increase in living standards that he was witnessing, and, and that until then was something new to humanity. A couple of years later, a couple of, of decades later, he wrote a new book called The Wealth of Nations, where he expanded on this concept. He expanded on the ideas behind the factors behind the creation of wealth. And he added a few more. Besides uh, uh, low taxes and, and, and uh, tolerable administration of justice, he added free trade, for example. And that was the wealth of nations, which is his most famous uh, work. But one of the interesting things about Adam Smith's uh, earlier observation is that he was identifying the ideas that we will let be developed into the concept of economic freedom. What is economic freedom? Economic freedom, the idea of economic freedom was developed in this, uh, uh, in this work uh, in the late 1970s. Uh, the economist Milton Friedman, uh, along with some of his colleagues, uh, began debating a way to measure economic freedom. Since the times of Adam Smith, we knew what factors were behind the creation of wealth. We knew what factors were behind the development of countries. Milton Friedman wanted to measure, somehow measure this. If there was a tangible measurement to compare countries and the policies, the economic policies of the different countries and see how, uh, how compatible they were with these concepts of economic freedom. So they produced uh, an index, an economic freedom index. It's like the FIFA index for, for uh, football, you know, for ranking countries according to how good they are. And Brazil is always like top in the charts. Well, in this case, they created an economic freedom index. And they identified five big components of economic freedom. One of them is the size of government. 
you know, if you have a country with low taxes, if you have a country with low spending, with a government with low spending as a, as a, as a chair of, of the GDP, as a chair of the size of the economy, if you have a country where the government doesn't engage in public companies, it doesn't have public companies, you know that in our countries it's pretty common that the government owns airlines, owns telecommunication companies, oil refinement companies, etc. Well, that reduces economic freedom. So the smaller the government, the better, uh, uh, according to, to this uh, index. Then you have the legal system and property rights. Here what you look at is that there is a government, of course, but this government should protect people and should protect the property of people. So here you look at the reliability of contracts. Here you look at the integrity of the judicial system, whether it's independent or not. You look at whether the military interferes in politics or the judiciary. You look at the protection of private property. You look at the cost of crime and so on. Basically, you look at whether a country has a tolerable administration of justice, as Adam Smith described 200 years earlier, the rule of law. Then you look at sound money. Here you look at whether a government corrupts the currency of the country. You know that many governments, when they don't have money, they go to the central bank and they ask the central bank to print money in order to finance themselves, and that creates inflation. Where here you look at the inflation rate. You look at whether people have access to foreign currencies. Usually the governments, when they tackle, when they create inflation, they prevent people from escaping inflation by owning foreign currencies. You also look at freedom to trade internationally, whether people have the freedom to trade, for Brazilians have the freedom to trade with Costa Ricans and for Costa Rica, or whether they have the tra freedom to trade with, uh, with Americans without paying enormous taxes. I know that, if, for example, bringing computers to Brazil is extremely expensive because you have to pay taxes. Or well, you look at the tariffs, those taxes, the level of taxation of foreign, uh, of foreign goods. You look also at the, at the, at the barriers to the, uh, to the movement of, of capital, whether you can move money easily between countries, whether you have to pay or you have to pay, you have to face capital controls. You also look at the freedom to travel, whether you have to get a visa or whether you have to uh, face other hurdles in order to travel to other countries. And finally, you look at regulations, business regulations, credit regulations, uh, labor market regulations. How easy is to hire people? How easy is to fire people? How easy is to start a business? How easy is to get a, a, a loan from a bank, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the big components of uh, economic freedom. As you can see, they relate to what Anne Smith was identifying 200 years earlier as the causes of economic development. So if we look at this index, which ranks 154 economies, we can see that, for example, the countries with the freest economies, those countries that are most open to trade, that control inflation, that have small governments, low taxes, rule of law, sensible regulations, they have by far the highest income per capita. They have by far the higher living standards. And why is so? Because these countries grow faster. What happened in those in the 1700s and 1800s is that the world economy began growing. We started experiencing economic growth. And the economy, the world economy has grown so fast, just to understand how much it has grown, that in 1820, the entire world economy was the size of the economy of South Korea right now. So that's how much the size of the pie has expanded. And those countries that have grown the most economically are the ones that have freer economic policies. Also, the countries with the freest economic institutions are the ones who are nearer to abolishing poverty, to getting rid of poverty. Poverty is almost non-existent in, rich, in, in, in economically free uh, economies, whereas the least free economies uh, still have a sizable chunk of their populations living under absolute poverty. And we understand poverty here as people living beneath the equivalent of $1.25 a day. If you look at uh, human development indicators, many people say, well, there, there are things that are more important than just per capita income. You have to take into account life expectancy. You have to take into account access to health care. You have to take into account access to education. And uh, sometimes 
it doesn't correspond whether you, whether, whether you have money or not to have access, uh, uh, sensible access to these uh, services and goods. Well, the UN Human Development Index, which is produced by the uh, United Nations every year, uh, they produce this index. And if you compare both indices, you look that the countries with the freest economies have the hum uh, higher uh, human development standards. For example, if you, look com if you compare life expectancy and economic freedom, you see that people in the freest economies tend to live even 20 years more than the people who live in the least free economies. Child mortality is significantly lower in those, in those, uh, in those countries. It's almost 10, per, uh, 10 times lower in the, least free in the most free economies than in the least free economies. And let me uh, mention an example which is uh, very telling is the example of India. Because if you look at these numbers just in graphs, you don't understand the magnitude of implementing the human cost of not implementing policies that have to do with economic freedom in, 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 in the different countries. You know that India, when it became independent in the, in the late 1940s from Britain, it adopted a very close economic model. It wasn't a Soviet economy, but it followed many of the, of the, of the uh, top-down economic controls of Soviet economies. The commanding heights of the economy, the big industries were owned by government. You have high public spending. The economy was close to international trade. India wanted to be self-sufficient, producing goods and, and services. There were high regulations on the, on the entrepreneurs. And India experienced a very low rate of economic growth for 30 years after independence. It was approximately 3.5% a year. It might be, you know, 3.5%, you might think that is respectable, but for a large country like India, whose population was also growing very fast, that meant that incomes were extended. The per capita income was basically standing. The population was rising as fast as the economy. So you have hundreds of millions of Indians living in poverty for most of India's history. In 1981, the government started opening up the economy. It started privatizing some industries. It opened up a little bit to international trade. It dismantled some controls on businesses. And growth picked up a little bit. It went on from 3.5% to 5% a year. And it grew 5% a year for most of the 1980s. And then in 1991, Manmohan Singh, who is the, until I think the last couple of days that he's the Prime Minister of India because there is another guy coming in. But Manmohan Singh was then the Finance Minister of India. He's now the Prime Minister. And he engaged in a more aggressive program of economic liberalization. They privatized more industries. They opened up to foreign investment. They got rid of the license raj, which was the name of this regulatory system that prevented people from opening up their own businesses. And India's growth rate skyrocketed. And we have witnessed in the last decade, at least, that India grew on average like 7 to 8% a year. And we have seen that hundreds of millions of Indians had escaped, have escaped poverty in recent years. So my colleague, my colleague Swaminathan Anklesedia, uh, we have a, he works at, at the Cato Institute with me. He's Indian. And he went on to make an experiment. And he was, what would have happened to India if the timid reforms of 1981 had taken place in 1971. Remember, those weren't the aggressive reforms of 1991. Those were the timid ones. And what would have happened to social indicators in India if that 5% growth rate we enjoy in the 1980s, we had had it in 1970s. And this 7 to 8% growth rate that we enjoy in the 1990s and 2000s, we had enjoyed it in the, 19, in the 1980s and 1990s and 2000s. Well, what he found was startling. He found that 4.5 million children will have survived given to a lower mortality rate. Economic growth, India's, mortality rate, uh, India's child mortality has decreased significantly since the 1980s because of economic growth, because the country has grown richer. Well, 
If those reforms had taken place 10 years earlier, just a decade earlier, 14.5 million children will have survived. Just look at how many the kids died because of the reforms being delayed 10 years. I don't want to belittle the Holocaust. That was a terrible human tragedy, but this is 12.5 times the, the number of, of Jews that were killed by Hitler in World, War, in World War II. He also found that 261 million Indians will have become literate if these economic reforms had taken place a decade earlier. 109 million Indians will have escaped poverty. So we see in a huge country like India the magnitude of the implementation of economic freedom, of reforms that relate to economic freedom, open borders, lower taxes, rule of law, sound monetary policies, low inflation, and sensible regulations. And since then, just like my colleague Swami uh, produced this study, there has been literally dozens, if not hundreds, of economic studies since the times of Adam Smith that show the correlation and the causation between economic liberty and progress. You can find the Economic Freedom Index online at uh, freetheworld.org. You can download it completely. You can see which are the, the countries that uh, enjoy the most economic freedom. Most of them tend to be small countries. Number one is Hong Kong, then it's followed by Singapore, Switzerland, New Zealand, you have Canada, uh, you have uh, Australia, you have Finland, and you see that there are no determinants for having institutions that correspond to economic uh, freedom. You don't have historical determinants, you don't have ethnographic determinants, you don't have cultural determinants. The countries that are most open uh, tend to be from all over from all the walks online, you have Chinese, you have Europeans, you have Anglo-Saxons. Uh, Chile is number 11, so you even have a Latino country there. And you can see that these countries that have uh, engaged in opening up their economies are the most prosperous, are the ones that provide the better, uh, better standards of living to their populations. So I, I encourage you to look at this index, learn more about economic freedom and why, as the example of India showed, is a matter, literally a matter of life and death. Thank you very much.